Okay, um, so before we get started, just want to remind everybody what we're doing for next time, right? So you're going to be reading the excerpts from Dorothy Wordsworth's El Fox and then Grass in the Journals for next time, okay? So what we're going to be looking at um, is the role Wordsworth's sister played, uh, not just as a kind of imaginative foil for him in some of his poems like we talked about last time with uh, Tintern Abbey, right, where the sister is kind of a prism through which he can see his own youthful reactions to the same scenes kind of uh, replayed, right? Um, but how she actually played an active role in shaping uh, her brother's work and Coleridge's work as well. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing for next time. Does anybody have any questions about anything that we are doing or have been doing? Everybody good? Okay, excellent. Um, so uh, let me just start with the simple, basic question. Uh, what did you guys think of this poem? Uh, it was kind of hard for me to understand. Okay, what made it hard for you? I don't know, I think it was just uh, probably like the language. Okay, yeah, um, Coleridge deliberately uses a lot of old-fashioned language. Right, so in fact, this poem is published in two versions. The original 1798 version is even harder to read. So the 1798 version includes more archaic spellings and vocabulary, and does not include those marginal glosses that we see, you know, sort of off to the side of the verses, right, where it tells you what's happening. That's what helped me understand. Okay, yeah, yeah. And he's actually, he's doing a very specific thing there as well. Those kinds of, those little marginal glosses are very typical of 16th and 17th century scholarly texts. Right, the idea being that if you were, you know, if you're reading a book and you were looking for particular passages or ideas, right, you can look in the margins and see, okay, this is where he's talking about that, right? So he's deliberately imitating old-fashioned models here of a couple of types. Um, any other reactions to the poem? And were you also confused mostly by the language, or did you find the plot hard to follow? Uh, both. Okay, yeah. yeah. Because of me not understanding and being able to comprehend, I couldn't really follow the plot. Okay, and the plot is a little bit convoluted. It's not always easy to figure out what's going on, right? And a lot of the things that happen seem to happen without any kind of preamble or motive, right? So there's also, yeah, the, this is a narrative poem. Right? There is a story here, but it jumps between two different frames, right? We have a framing narrative, in which the mariner is telling his story to this wedding guest that he has just kind of shanghai right? On his way to a party. Right, he's just caught this guy and stopped him with his glittering eye and forces him to sit down and listen to his tale. And inside that frame is right, that tale of killing the albatross and the mariner's penance, right? So there's a, there's a story on the outside and a story on the inside, right? The main story is what's on the inside. What's happening in the frame is really important, so the structure of this is important. Um, anything else that you guys have questions about or that you guys noticed about this poem before I proceed? Yeah, Alex. I didn't really understand why the, the mariner had to um, get the why, why did they punish him so bad when all he did was 
Uh -huh. Why are you going through so much just for that? For killing a bird, yeah. yeah. Okay, and yeah, um, and I think a lot of that is that that attitude of the albatross is just a bird mm -hmm. is part of the problem here, right? Um, in a lot of ways, what this poem is really about is communication and connection. And that careless, offhand killing of the albatross, which is doing no one any harm, and in fact is practically tame, right? It's almost a pet at that point, um, is seen as sinful exactly because, because there was no good reason to do it, right? There was no good reason to kill this animal that wasn't hurting anyone and was in fact friendly. And you know, notice too that you know it's when the mariner is able to bless the sea creatures that he's been cursing all this time, right? That that's when the curse starts to starts to fall away. So the curse starts to break, right? So it's not until he can see his connection to other beings in nature that he is able to be free of this curse. Um, and there are a couple of other readings of the killing of the albatross that we'll, get, we'll, kind of, we'll, we'll, we'll go through. Um, some are more convincing than others. Um, but I think that's the big thing that's going on here, right? Is that a lot of, in a lot of ways, this poem is about the mariner's alienation from other people and the rest of nature. And the idea is to try to get him reintegrated back into society in some way. But I think as we'll see, one of the things that's weird about the poem is that it doesn't quite work, right? He doesn't really get reintegrated. And in fact, is stopping this wedding guest from participating in the kind, exactly the kind of um, celebration that reinforces community and kinship ties, right? He is literally stopping this guy on his way to a friggin' wedding, right? And the wedding guest tells her, you know, I am next of kin, right? You know, I'm, you know, he's, so he's got some kind of important connection to the groomer. He's the best man or something, right? But the power of the mariner's eye keeps him fixed to the spot and from participating in this community ritual. What does that say to tell the what? Albatross. Okay. Does everybody know what an albatross is, by the way? Okay, because I've noticed that, like, I tend to assume that you know what it is, and I've noticed in the past semesters that's been a sticking point too, is that people aren't familiar with what an albatross is. Okay, can you infer from context what it is? It's like a giant bird. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it, it's, it's a bird with enormous wings and a very small body, right? So it's incredibly graceful in the air, but kind of clumsy and comical on land, right? It's got these enormous wings that it carries around behind it, can't, it can't really walk effectively, but it flies beautifully and gracefully, right? Um, and yeah, it, it, it's a seabird, and they're usually regarded by sailors as good luck. Right? If you see an albatross, it's supposed to be good luck, in part because it probably indicates that the weather is conducive to birds flying. Yeah, Alex? Uh, is the albatross like a real type of bird, or is it fiction? Oh, no, it, it, it's, it's real. They're real. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they do exist, yes. Okay. <laughs> Yes, Alba, Alba, the albatross is real. Um, any other questions or comments? Like anything else that I can clear up for you before we start getting a little deeper into this? Okay, then let's talk a little bit about the origins of the poem. And then we can maybe get, maybe get a little deeper into the content. So, um, as we talked about last time, um, this poem was published as part of a joint volume that William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge put out together called Lyrical Ballads. The first edition of which was published in 1798. And then there were subsequent editions in 1802 and 1812 that added 
explanatory prefaces. Written by Wordsworth. But the 1798 edition did not include the author's names and did not include any kind of explanatory material as to what these poems were or how they were different from conventional poetry of the time. So let's actually go back to a little bit of what we talked about last time when we discussed neoclassicism and romanticism. Does anybody remember what the basic values of neoclassical poetry were? Yeah, we talked about this when we discussed Wordsworth. At least I thought we did. So neoclassicism is the dominant British literary movement of the 18th century. And the key word in this is classical. Right, when, we, when we see the word classical used in this way, what this usually means, what this is a reference to, is Greek and Roman antiquity, right? So when we talk about the classical world or classical influences, we're talking about ancient Greece and ancient Rome, right? So, if this movement calls itself neoclassical, and classical refers to um, the culture of Greece and Rome, ancient Greece and Rome, what then does that suggest about what their what their values are? What what can we tell right away from looking at this word about what it means? What are they trying to bring back or revive? Religion? Uh, not so much religion, because remember the ancient Greeks and Romans. Um, practice their own pagan religions, right? Neo means new, right? So new classical means that the value here is imitation of Greek and Roman models, right? So they write in genres that the Greeks and Romans prefer. So things like epic, tragedy, elegy, which is kind of a uh, memory poem, pastoral, or poems about shepherds, uh, satire, things of that nature, right? So they write genres that the Greeks and Romans preferred. Um, Neoclassical authors do not view artificiality as a bad thing, right? In fact, that art is a craft, like all arts are, are a craft. So they don't care to be realistic or? No, it's, the, it's not so much they don't care to be realistic, it's that um, they don't necessarily believe that because something is man-made, it's bad, right? That all art is, in fact, man-made. It's a craft, and anybody who practices it will get better at it, right? Essentially, anybody can be a poet if they learn the rules of poetry, right? Okay, so you, you, know, you learn where to place your stresses, you learn where to place your rhymes, you learn how to work in a particular genre, that's how you become a poet, right? You do training and practice. Um, they prefer urban subjects, usually. And their key theme is human beings in society. Right? They're much more concerned with human social life than they are with individuals, typically, um, or with the natural world. In fact, the natural world is usually only interesting to them as it relates to human beings. 
So like these pastoral poems, these poems about shepherds, right? They're not really about shepherds. They're about sophisticated urban poets pretending to be shepherds to make particular political arguments, usually. Now, romanticism, on the other hand, right, is a phenomenon of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And from our discussion of Wordsworth, what do we remember about romanticism? About romanticism in general, not about Wordsworth specifically. What sorts of things do romantic writers value and artists value? Okay, yeah, the sublime over the beautiful. Like the neoclassicists tend to prefer the beautiful. Right? The orderly, the rational. Well, like the Gothic writers before them, the romanticists tend to prefer the sublime. The awe-inspiring and the irrational. Good. What else do we remember about romanticism? Is that when they are, when they are writing about nature? Um, nature is important to them, but not the way that we tend to think it is, right? So is nature important, for those of you who remember uh, last time, is nature important to a romantic writer for its own sake? Yeah. What, what do they do with nature? What is nature important to them for? To, to bring back a or they remember, a Yeah, again, it is all about the relationship between the natural world and the human being, right? Mm -hmm. Although, here we're talking about an individual human having an experience of nature. So nature, is usually a spur or a catalyst for intellectual activity, right? Remember that outside inside pattern that we call the greater romantic lyric? All right, the poet observes the outside world, ruminates upon it, and then looks outward again, applying his ruminations to whatever he's looking at, right? This poem doesn't work quite that way, for reasons that we'll talk about um, in a moment. Anything else to remember about romanticism? Does romanticism care about groups or about individuals? Yeah. Romanticism is much more about the individual speaking voice, right? An individual speaker having some kind of intense experience and describing it, right? Um, and what about its attitude towards poetic inspiration? Does a romantic writer think that poetry is a craft that you simply learn through practice, or does it require inspiration and originality? It requires inspiration? Yeah. That, you know, the, Art is a sort of, you know, work of a solitary mind and solitary genius, right? This is kind of where we get a lot of the contemporary idea of artists and writers as these kinds of solitary geniuses whose life goes into their work in some way, right? Um, exactly the kind of thing that I usually try to beat out of you in these classes. So. What this often means is that a lot of romantic writers will say that you know, spontaneity is what's important, and you have to just sort of you know, get your ideas down on paper. But it's not true that they didn't revise and they didn't shape um, <coughs> their, uh, their ideas once they had them down, right? So one thing we'll see when we look at Dorothy Wordsworth's journals is just how carefully and how frequently William Wordsworth revised his poems before publishing them. And we can already see, right, that Coleridge um, published at least two versions of this poem in his lifetime, right? Um, so spontaneity is a value, but the way Wordsworth framed it in his uh, 1812 preface to Lyrical Ballads is that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings 
And here comes the important part. Recollected in tranquility. So you are recording an intense emotional experience, right? Or an intense thought experience. But can you actually write poetry when you're in that kind of state of excitement? Maybe, right? But at least according to Wordsworth's theory here, right, it's going to be a lot easier and it's going to be a lot better if you wait till you've calmed down, right? Wait till the experience is over and you've had some time to sit and ruminate on it. So yeah, so those spontaneous emotional experiences are important, but they're not the poem, right? The poem is what you do with that experience afterward, when you're just kind of sitting at home in your study, tranquilly reflecting. Now, this idea of um, genius is also important to romantic writers. So uh, Coleridge, later in his life, will publish a book called the Biographia Literaria. And it's a weird book. Um, some of it is autobiography. Much of it, the best parts of it, are literary theory. Um, parts of it are German idealist philosophy, like just literally translated from Immanuel Kant and then not credited. Because he was on a deadline and he got scared and he did a certain number of words. So <clears throat> the big idea of the Biographia Literaria is that the imagination works in essentially two, or creativity works in essentially two parts, right? There are two different kinds of creativity. The first and lesser part, Coleridge calls the fancy. And the fancy is essentially just a form of memory. Right? You're taking sense experiences that you've had, sense impressions, and you're just rearranging them. So say you know, you've seen a number of different animals. Right? Um, you know, you've seen um, a goat and a horse. You've seen farms before. You just put the goat and the horse that you've seen on an imaginary farm, right? That's the work of the fancy, right? And that is what Coleridge regards as the lesser creative faculty. You're just taking things you've already seen and putting them in different situations. Now, if you take that goat and that horse and you melt them together into a single creature, a unicorn, right? Then what you are doing is using, your, using the imagination. Right, the imagination melts down sense impressions to create entirely new objects or ideas. So this is the superior faculty, right? When you're able to take a bunch of things that you've seen or smelled or touched or tasted, and instead of just putting them in, uh, like just putting them in different situations, actually melting them into something new and different, right? So <clears throat> this is the basic orientation of early stage British Romanticism. It's a reaction to, or a reaction against, neoclassicism, and its value of the artificial, the beautiful, the urban, and human social life. And it's really important, again, that the Romantics tend to celebrate the individual, which is actually one of the things that makes this poem weird as a Romantic poem because it actually kind of decries the mariner for behaving in too individual a fashion, right? The mariner ends up alienated. 
Um, <clears throat> does anybody have any questions about romanticism before we proceed? Okay, so let's look then at this title, Lyrical Ballads, because the title itself actually tells us some things about romantic values, right? So the combination of the word lyric and the word ballads um, is telling here. Uh, when we talk about lyric poetry, what do we mean? Does anybody know what we mean by a lyric poem? Yeah, Kyla. Um, something that's in a certain order? Um, yeah, I mean, it is usually arranged, you know, in terms of meter and rhyme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alex. Uh, not necessarily narrative, but more like describing or talking about something. Yeah, lyric is non-narrative poetry, right? And it usually yeah, it describes a feeling or an idea. Right, it's called lyric poetry because in Greek society, um, <coughs> poets reciting these aloud would have strung the small harp called a lyre while they did so. Right, they were, they were always accompanied by music in ancient Greece. This is no longer the case. But um, the name is this. Now, does anybody know what a ballad is? And don't think of it in terms of like contemporary pop music, right? Where a ballad is a slow song about people's feelings, right? Is it something tragic? No. Often, but not always. So a ballad is a short narrative poem they're usually taken from the folk tradition rather than um, <clears throat> from an educated tradition like a lyric is, right? So a lyric poet has to know about things like rhyme and meter, right? A lyric poet is usually someone educated. Um, ballads are simply sort of like spread orally in folk cultures. Um, in fact, there's usually variant, there are usually variant versions and there are no identified authors. Uh, what else? Oh, um, and the narrative in a ballad almost always starts what we call in media race, which means in the middle of the action. We mean uh, variant authors. You mean like a lot of people don't write those kinds of poems? Right, I mean, uh, variant versions. What that means is that the same ballad um, will be retold in different forms by different people in different places, right? This is actually something that's kind of characteristic of oral cultures, right? Um, you know, somebody hears a story, like say, you know, uh, you know, somebody in Nottingham hears a story in Manchester and goes back home and tells the story, but it might be slightly different when he retells it, right? And then the people who he hears it from, who hear it from him might retell it in a different fashion. Now, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, well, ballads actually do have a pretty consistent structure, um, but it's not based on an educated tradition, I think is the, the big difference here, right? Um, and it does tell a story, ballad does tell a story. Although it doesn't tell the whole story, it starts in the middle, and we only see the climax. So we don't typically see the beginning or the end of the action. We just see that key moment, right? So let's turn to an example here. Um, if you go to your anthology and turn to page 36, uh, Sir Patrick Spence. This is an old Scottish ballad. And 
The thing I want you to pay particularly close attention to is the rhythm of the lines and the rhyme scheme. The king sits in Dumferlin town, drinking the blood red wine. Oh, where will I get a good sailor to sail this ship of mine? Up in Spock, an elder Nick sat at the king's right knee. Sir Patrick Spence is the best sailor that sails upon the sea. The king has written a brave letter and signed it with his hand, and sent it to Sir Patrick Spence, who was walking on the sand. The first line that Sir Patrick read, a loud lock lock at he. The next line that Sir Patrick read, the tear blinded his e. Um, so essentially what's going to happen here over the course of this is that Sir Patrick Spence is being sent off on essentially a suicide mission to sail a ship in Scotland in the winter. Um, and the ship sinks and he and all the nobles that he's carrying aboard die. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Paula. The words that are on the right side, um, what are those? What are they just like a translation of words? Yeah, 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 exactly. That's just like it, when the, if the spelling is unusual or if it's an archaic word that we don't use anymore, mm -hmm. then they'll just put it in the margins for you like that. So you know what it means. Now what I would like to do is then move to the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner on page 448 and keep that rhythm in mind from those lines in Sir Patrick Spence. Right? Can I get a volunteer to read uh, the first stanza of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner on page 448? You said 448? 448. I can read it. What am I starting from? Part one? From It Is an Ancient Mariner, yep. Okay. It is an ancient mariner, and he stopped of one of the three. By the long gray beard and glitter, I now wear for stops down me. That's how you say it? Yep. The um, oh. And yeah, again, what I want you to pay attention to the sound, the rhythm and the rhyme scheme here, right? Notice how similar this is to that ballad rhyme scheme, right? That ballad rhythm. So that is exactly where Coleridge is taking the style of the poem from, right? He is adopting that ballad style. And we have here an educated poet taking and adapting a folk tradition, right? And that's a big part of what Wordsworth and Coleridge were about here. This is a big part of the early British Romantic mission, right? we are going to bring folk poetry and folk traditions and rural traditions into the artistic mainstream. Yeah, Alex? I know this isn't the same type of thing, but it kind of reminds me of like science fiction where it's like, uh -huh. oh, the planet is going to be kind of like taking like something that exists in like say contemporary science mm -hmm. and trying to project like how far it will go um, in future. Yeah, I, th I think it, it, it's, it's, a, it's not quite the same thing, but it is a little bit similar, yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that helps with uh, Coleridge's mission in particular um, is that in the mid 18th century, um, a bishop by the name of Thomas Percy, an Anglican bishop, published a book called Relics of Ancient English Poetry. And essentially what this was, was a collection of these ballads and some of their variant versions, right? So this was available in a readily accessible published form to Coleridge. Um, you know, this book actually did cause kind of a sensation. Um, in the mid-18th mid century. Like, people were genuinely excited by and interested in this. Um, the same sorts of people often who were building those, you know, gothic follies on their property where they, were, you know, they would have this, you know, these romance forests where they would have, like, pay a hermit to live in a cave and shit like that, right? Um, this was very appealing to that type of person. So, in a lot of ways, romanticism is both forward-looking and backward-looking. It's not backward looking in quite the same way as neoclassicism was, 
but it is looking back on a kind of imagined folk past that it tends to idealize. Now one more thing about uh, lyrical ballads and its construction and its plan uh, before we get back into the poem here. Um, so Wordsworth and Coleridge divided up the work. Now as it turns out, the only poem of Coleridge's that appeared in lyrical ballads was The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. But this alone was as long as Wordsworth's contributions, right? So they still had about an equal share in the size of the book. Now Wordsworth was responsible for sketches of rural life. While Coleridge was focusing on another, in particular, the aspect of the irrational in what they were doing. His focus was on the supernatural. So the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner actually ends up being very different in tone from anything that Wordsworth contributed. Um, all of Wordsworth's work in lyrical ballads is very much rooted in the real world. Coleridge, you know, gives us a ship crewed by zombie sailors, right? You know, he gives us these nature spirits that visit curses upon a mariner who defies them, right? And this figure that is forced to wander the earth for God knows how long, stopping people with his skinny brown hand and his glittering eye and forcing them to listen to his tale, right? Um, he seems to have some kind of like hypnotic or mesmeric influence um, on... Uh, the wedding guest, right? There's something not normal about the Mariner when he first appears. Okay, so um, does anybody have any questions about this stuff or about how it applies to the poem uh, before we start getting into the poem itself? There is actually, by the way, a lot of this poem that is rooted in the real world and in real experience. Um, not Coleridge's own direct real experience, uh, but certainly it is, it is actually closely related to certain things that we have already talked about. So any questions, guys? Okay. Now I think the first thing I want to do is try to map out the poem. Right? Let's look at the route that the Mariner takes. and see what we can make of that, um, and what kind of mission he must have been on, or you know, what, what the ship's purpose must have been if he was taking this excuse me, particular route. OK, so this, so up here is written. And the blue lines indicate the route that the mariner takes, at least up until the point at which uh, the spirits bring the ship quickly back to England, right? So we start in England. And then notice where the ship is initially headed. If you look on page 449, the ship was cheered, the harbor cleared, merrily did we drop, below the kirk, below the hill, below the house, the, the lighthouse top. The sun came up upon the left, out of the sea came he, and he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea. So if the sun is coming up on the left and going down on the right, what direction are we traveling in? West. Not west. Well, no, normally, the west, like if we're facing north, right, 
then the west is on our left and the east is on our right, right? So if the sun is coming up on the left and going down on the right, what direction are we facing? South. Exactly, we're traveling south. Higher and higher every day till over the mass at noon. So if the sun is over the mass at noon, what does that indicate about location globally? Does anybody know? Well, they actually are moving down into the southern hemisphere. It means, right? it means that they're close to the equator. So they're heading south towards the equator. And as we see here, where does that put them before they get blown off course? Yeah, they're on the coast of West Africa, right? They're near um, the Gold Coast, what's called the Gold Coast of Africa, right? And so what does that suggest about the ship's mission? What are they probably doing? Think about this in terms of that trade triangle we talked about. Yeah, they are probably coming down to the Gold Coast to pick up slaves to take to the Caribbean, right? But they never actually accomplish that mission because then the ship gets blown off course by a storm, right? Blown down to this land of the ice and snow, right? So Antarctica. And <clears throat> they end up way off course up in the Pacific. And this is where the ship stops. And everybody dies of dehydration except the mariner, right? Now the other thing to know, the other thing that connects this potentially to the slave trade, apart from the fact that we already know from our previous reading that prior to being well known as a poet, Coleridge was well known as an activist who had given lectures urging people to boycott Caribbean sugar, right? To try to disrupt the slave trade. So we know that this is something that he thinks about and something that he is concerned with. Um, where was it? Now the other thing to know is what happens to the sailors um, as, they, uh, <clears throat> as they sicken um, if we look on page 452. Oh, no, I'm um, sorry, I think it's uh, 451. All, right. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, right up above the masted sand stand no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, no breath nor motion as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. The very deep did rot, O oh Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. So the first reference to the sea creatures in regards is disgusting, right? About, about, and reel and round the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burned green and blue and white. And some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so, Nine fathom deep he had followed us from the land of the mist and snow. And every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root. We could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot. Uh, well a day what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. There passed a weary time, each throat was parched and glazed each eye. A weary time, a weary time, how glazed each weary eye, when looking westward I beheld a something in the sky. At first it seemed a little speck, and then it seemed a mist. It moved and moved and took at last a certain shape, I wist. A speck, a mist, a shape, I wist, and still it neared and neared. As if it dodged a water sprite, it plunged and tacked and veered. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we could not laugh nor wail. Through utter drought, all dumb we stood. I bit my arm, I sucked the blood, and cried, a sail, a sail. So he's so dehydrated, he has to suck his own blood just to wet his throat enough to speak, right? Now this level of dehydration combined with the black lips 
And we're told at various times of the brownness of the mariner, right? His brown and skinny hand and so forth. Um, there are critics who have argued that what this mimics are the symptoms of yellow fever. Um, which is, are any of you familiar at all with yellow fever? Anybody know what it is? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's often spread by mosquitoes, uh, like malaria. But like malaria, it's a tropical disease, right? So it is not something that typically affect, afflicts British sailors unless they are trading in the tropical zones, right? So yellow fever was a common ailment among sailors who were engaged in the triangular slave trade. So some critics do then connect this set of symptoms to that particular occupation, um, which would also uh, kind of speak well to the general orientation of the poem and its attitudes towards um, life and community, right? Uh, now, <clears throat> so this is where the Mariner's journey basically stops at least for the time being, right? Now, what did you guys make of the, the death ship? Did that make any sense to you at all? Back in the water. Okay, the, yeah, it, it comes out of nowhere, right? And this figure, life in death, is not known from any mythological tradition or folklore tradition or anything, right? She's completely unique to this poem. So if you didn't recognize her from any, if you were trying to recognize, like, what the hell is this figure, right? you're not going to figure it out because you've never seen this before, right? So, it probably helps to then just think about how she functions within the poem, right? And her appearance within the poem. So she accompanies death on this skeletal ship, right? If we look on page 453, uh, can I get somebody uh, to describe, or somebody to read on page 453 the, the stance of the charts, her lips were red, her looks were free. Yeah, go ahead. Her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow with gold. Her skin was as white as leprosy. The nightmare, life and death was she, who fixed men's blood with gold. Is one of these things not like the others? Yeah. Red lips and golden locks are conventional in poetic descriptions of beautiful, healthy women, right? Skin white as leprosy, not so much, yeah? Right, in fact, like, we tend to associate incredibly pale white skin, right, with death or with illness, right? And it might help if we compare life and death to the only other female figure who appears directly in the poem, right, the bride. So if we go back to page 449, can I get uh, somebody to read uh, the stanza that starts with the bride hath paced into the hall? The bride hath paced into the hall, ready to roll the sheet, not in the head before her goes, the very mesh dressed. Okay, we don't get much of a description of the bride, right? What do we get here about her appearance? Red is a rose. Now, how does this compare to skin white as leprosy? It means she's happy. Well, you can tell that she's happy because she's probably blushing. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we associate like, like a, you know, a red or rosy glow, right, with happiness and health, right?
And again, if we think about this poem as being about um, alienation and reintegration, and about community and kinship ties, right? What is the, the bride is reinforcing one of those community ties, right? Is forging a new kinship tie. And so looks healthy, right? What does life and death do to the mariner? Well, does she actually talk to him? I don't think she does. I think she talks to death. Yeah, they're playing a game of dice, yeah. right? Yeah, the naked Hulk alongside Kane, page 453, and the twain were casting dice. The game is done, I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistles thrice, right? So apparently she and death are throwing dice for members of the crew, right? She wins the Mariner, so he lives while everyone else dies, right? So think about the consequences of this in terms of who and what the bride is. So the bride creates new community ties, right? Mm -hmm. What does life and death create? Isolation. Yeah, she creates isolation and alienation, right? I mean, it's ultimately the mariner's own stupid fault that he's alone, right? But life and death is the one who comes along and makes that condition of reality. Like, makes that spiritual condition, or that metaphysical condition, a physical condition, right? He is actually alone now, after this. Even when the bodies come back to life later on, right, to um, work the ship. If we look on page 457, right, the helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up blue, the mariners all again worked the ropes where they were wont to do. They raised their limbs like lifeless tools. We were a ghastly crew. The body of my brother's son stood by me, knee to knee. The body and I pulled at one rope, but he said not to me. So even this former close kinship tie, right? This is his nephew. is working alongside him, but does not speak to him, right? So the idea here being that those ties that he broke by killing the albatross are still broken, right? He hasn't made that connection again yet. So is this starting to make more sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, so let's look a little bit prior to this. Um, where the Mariner, actually, you know, let's, let's actually, let's look. We haven't really talked about this. Um, the death of the albatross here. If you look on page uh, 450, can I get somebody to read uh, the end of part one, from at length did cross an albatross down to I shot the albatross. Yeah, go ahead. You said 451? 450. From at length did cross an albatross down to I shot the albatross. Oh, okay. At length did cross an albatross there through, throughout? Through. It's, through. it's just through, but two syllables. Okay. Throughout, oh, through the fog he came, as it had been a Christian soul, we held it in God's name. It ate the food it near had ate, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with the thunder fit. The hellsmen steered us through in the good south with wind struck up behind. The albatross did fall every day for food or play came to, Mar to Mariner's Hollow. And Mr. Cloud, on master shout, it perched for vespers nine, whiles all the night through fog smoke white glimmered the white moon shine. 
God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why look, that was so, mm -hmm. my crossbow, I shot the albatross. Okay, so, is any motive offered for the killing of the albatross? No. Yeah, it seems completely senseless, right? Mm -hmm. Now, one reading of this that I sometimes find convincing and sometimes not has to do with the nature of um, a crossbow as a device, right? How is a crossbow, does anybody know, different from a regular bow? They have a trigger, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it might help us burn it, so. Yeah, a crossbow is mechanical, right? Um, like a regular bow, you have to, you know, requires your strength yeah. to move the arrow. So it's you know your your strength being converted into energy that pushes the arrow forward. A crossbow, on the other hand, yeah, there's a machine, there's a winch that you pull back and lock the mechanism, and then it just stores that energy until you fire the trigger. So the argument is that the killing of the albatross and its consequences are in part a kind of anti-machinery diatribe on the part of Coleridge. That the problem with a machine like a crossbow is that it makes killing too easy. That machine, that you know, mechanizing things leads to thoughtless destruction. Because odds are, the mariner doesn't sit and think about how much that bird is pissing him off and winch that crossbow, right? Because it takes a little while. It's probably already winched and sitting there, and he just thoughtlessly picks it up and fires. Now, I'm not entirely sure that I buy this argument, but it's an interesting one. I think that probably what's more important to recognize here is the thoughtlessness of it rather than the means through which it's accomplished, right? That this is just, you know, some guy on a ship who tries to re reinforce his dominance of nature by killing some poor innocent bird, right? Weren't they taking care of it, or am I reading it wrong? No, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it was basically a pet, right? It's, it's showing up, you know, to, you know, they, they feed it, they play with it, right? And then it goes, it, you know, it's you know, even kind of standing up on the mast like a, like a mascot or a lookout, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to be guiding them through the ice and snow. And then the mariner ungratefully and inhospitably kills it. And this seems to be the general attitude he has towards non-human life. If we look um, in part four, in kind of like the deepest pits of his alienation here. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone in a wide, wide sea. And never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. The many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie, and a thousand thousand slimy things looked on, lived on, and so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea, and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven and tried to pray, but wherever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. So compare the way he describes the men the way he describes the sea creatures, right? What does this show about who, who and what he values more? Right, the many men so beautiful versus the thousand thousand slimy things. Seems like he um, values human life more than nature. Yeah, yeah, he seems to be regarding human beings as something better than the sea creatures, right? Something different from and better than the sea creatures. And then on the next page, beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire, 
Blue, glossy green, and velvet black, they coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. Oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The selfsame moment I could pray, and from my neck so free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. So once he is able to identify with and appreciate the beauty of other creatures, right? This is when the curse starts to break, right? First evidence of this being right that he can pray again and the albatross falls off of his neck. So this reintegration seems to be the goal, right? But let's look and see how this works out, because I think that the end of the poem is actually really problematic. Can I get somebody to start reading? on page 463, starting with since then, at an uncertain hour. Since then, at an uncertain hour, the agony returns until my ghastly tale is told, this heart will be burned. Do you want me to go to the end? Yeah, just, yeah I'll, I'll tell you when to stop. I pass like night from land to land that has strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me. To him my tale I teach. What loud uproar burst from that door, the wedding guests are gay. But in the garden bower the bride, and bride made singing all. And hark the little vesper bell, which bidded me to pray. O wedding guest, this soul hath been alone on a wide wide sea. So lonely twas that God himself scarce seemed there to be. O sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me, to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company. To walk together to the curb and all to pray, while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends, and youths and maids gay. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest, who prayeth well, who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. Who prayeth best, who loveth best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, who made and loveth all. The mariner whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is now gone, is gone, and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned and is of sins forlorn, a sadder and wiser man who rose to the morrow morn. Okay, thank you. Um, so, One thing to note here is that notion of pantheism, right, that we talked about last time we discussed Wordsworth. Does anybody remember what pantheism means? God is in everything? Yeah, right, the idea that everything is part of some larger divine spirit, right? That God is in everything, yes. Um, but the other thing to note here, too, is like, does the mariner actually seem to have been forgiven for what he did? Yeah, it seems like the punishment continues, right? Mm -hmm. Every now and again, he's just seized with this fit, and he has to go and stop some poor sap and make him listen to this long and weird tale, right? And what's the effect of this on the wedding guest? He's isolated himself after that. Yeah, the message doesn't seem to have had the intended effect, right? Mm -hmm. He went like one that hath been stunned and is of sense forlorn, a sadder and a wiser man who rose the morrow morn. So whatever, the, so this revelation the mariner makes to the wedding guest doesn't seem to have done him any good, right? It's made him unhappy, it's alienated him, and it stopped him from going into this community celebration that he was on his way to, right? So, <clears throat> this is really, for me, like, I don't know what to do with this, and this is why I always bring it up, 
because it is really, really puzzling, right? If the poem is about reintegration and connection and community, why does it end this way? And I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Is it supposed to be ironic? Um, maybe. Um, you know, um, what would make you think it's ironic, Alex? Because the whole point of what he went through was um, it isolated him, and so mm -hmm. he wanted to like integrate himself back into society. He thought he achieved that, but uh -huh. in the end, he just spread the isolation to other people. Yeah, the isolation seems to be what he, it seems almost like something he infects others with, right? The sense of sadness that he carries with him, the sense of loneliness. So he preaches this message of togetherness while disrupting exactly the kinds of things that would actually, that actually bring people together. Much as he you know, destroyed his own um, communal ties aboard the ship uh, through being, basically through being an asshole, right? Yeah, so I mean, there, there is, I mean, there is, whether the irony is intentional or not, I don't know, but it's defi there is definitely an irony there, right? I don't know, do you guys have any other thoughts about this? So yeah, I, you know, I, I, I sometimes feel like it's kind of cruel to leave you on a note like this, and it's like, we don't know what to do here. Right? <laughs> I'm just going to leave everybody dang, dangling. You know, that's, uh, yeah, um, but yeah, I feel like this is kind of one of those questions for which there is no real satisfactory answer, right? Um, and remember, too, that one of the things that romanticism values is that sense of the irrational. Right? They like it when things don't wrap up in a tiny little package. So perhaps that is part of the intended effect. Um, okay, so that is all I have for you guys today. Does anybody have any questions? Did you um, ever grade the response for that sleep or not yet? I haven't yet. I'm, I'm going to get to that this afternoon. Was there a test on this? There, there was not, no. So if there was not a quiz for this, what does that mean you should be looking out for on Wednesday night? A quiz Exactly, yep. Okay. Yeah, just you know, yeah, make, make sure that you always check the Georgia View page around 8 o'clock on Monday and Wednesday night. But you know that if you didn't get one on Monday, you're probably going to get one on Wednesday, right? Okay. All right. Um.